in the two sessions prior to the last one, uh, I had s sorted out a, what must have been a bewildering array of different sorts of things that go into the, uh, the framing of various standards of conduct for professionals and uh, spent a, a, a real lot of time talking about uh, factors from within the profession <coughs> that generate standards of conduct. And then at the beginning of uh, the last session, I talked about uh, various factors outside the profession that have an influence on professional standards of conduct as well. Uh, and what that must have led to is a certain uh, confusion about what in the world one's supposed to do when there's all these different pressures, often conflicting, not, not, certainly not all in harmony, how is a person supposed to sort through all those things? Um, if what you're supposed to do is to figure out all the different uh, persons who might be affected by your action, that's likely to be very complex. If you're trying to figure out all the different principles that might be involved and how to uh, organize them and arrange them in some sort of hierarchy, that might seem hopelessly complex. And so what I suggested to you was that <clears throat> there is a certain attractiveness to that virtue or character-based approach to ethics that uh, uh, attempts to cope with the, uh, the complexity of real-life ethical decision-making, or at least it, it, it says that it, it can help us cope with that. It suggests that we shouldn't worry so much about trying to make uh, ethical decisions on the basis of some sort of theoretical considerations or some sort of cognitive considerations. What we should really do is to try and build our character to, uh, to be good people, to be ethical people. Now that presents something of a problem. How do you go about doing that? I mean, how can I improve? I mean, I suppose uh, I was making the assumption that everybody starts off uh, wanting all things considered to be, or preferring to be good than to, be, to being bad. Uh, people want to make the right decisions. They sometimes find themselves unable to do that. If, uh, the situation is, um, is constrained in such a way so that they can't make what they think is the best decision. Uh, how can you uh, arrange things so that you're more likely to make the right decision in the future? And that's where we had these, these steps. And the cognitive first step was this. I, I, I suggested that in developing one's character, according to these theories, developing one's character uh, you might uh, think uh, of the analogy of, the, uh, of an athlete or a musician or someone who's trying to develop a skill. Uh, you don't ever start from complete zero, but you usually have some kind of idea of what you're doing. Uh, but you begin from where you are, and uh, the, the first step is perhaps to, to consult some of these theories. The first step in building one's character and improving one's ability to, to choose the right over the wrong, uh, the first step might be to consult something like consequentialism or some internalistic theory or maybe even egoism, but to, to consult some sort of theory to try and help you figure out how to make uh, the right decisions. And this is comparable to um, beginning to learn a skill by looking at, uh, looking at books, consulting teachers, consulting experts who then will give you advice. And uh, just as there might be a cognitive first step to learning to ride a bicycle, namely where you're trying to remember to keep your hands straight and you're trying to remember and you're th you just, just think back at the times when you've learned something like that. And there's a stage at which you're trying to follow all the advice that you've been given. And your mind is engaged in a, in a very clear way. You're really thinking hard about these things. And you're also probably aware of how difficult it is to juggle all those things and to obey all the advice that you've been given. It's not an easy thing to do. But you start by, by doing it, by trying to follow the advice. Um, then, that's the cognitive first step. Is that fairly clear? I mean, the, the, the same way uh, I suggested uh, one might uh, begin one's effort to uh, uh, make right decisions more a part of one's character, ethically right decisions. Okay, that's, this is all according to this particular approach I'm taking, this virtue-based, character-based approach. It, this particular version of it allows for uh, the influence of, of 
cognitive considerations, but only at that first novice step. Okay, and then one goes beyond one hopes, as one practices, as one does this more and more, it gets absorbed in one's character and perhaps becomes something a little closer like second nature. Now that's the first part of the story. I don't want to tell the first or even repeat the first part of the story without going on to the second. There are great dangers in imagining then that one suddenly becomes an ethical expert in the same way that one might become an expert in tennis. The dangers being that one might become uh, uh, less than adequately alert to places where the way you have been just don't, doesn't work. Um, you have to be constantly on the alert to uh, factors in the environment that, uh, that might show you that your approach has been wrong, that the decisions you've made have been not as good as they might have been. One has to be always alert to this possibility. And uh, there I compared attempting to do the right uh, uh, attempting to be a good person and do the right thing compared it with uh, the attitude of the scientist. Where the scientist does have theories that he is or she is relatively committed to, but there is a, uh, a constant, well, hopefully there is a constant uh, attention to the possibility that the theory might be um, uh, adversely Im affected by some experiment or another. And similarly in, in life, as one uh, brings one's character to bear into life. One, 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 one lives, one acts. Uh, one has to be always on the alert for the possibility that uh, one hasn't completely taken into consideration all that, all that should be taken into consideration, that one might be wrong. One has to have kind of an experimental attitude uh, toward, uh, toward the application of whatever principles or whatever character one's developed. Now, did you get the cognitive first step part? I mean, I wanted to shove that, frame that in the, in the whole works. OK. Any other questions? Uh, just going back to that one, could you kind of say that cognitive first step would sort of be like just collecting knowledge from different sources? No, it's really it's trying to apply uh, cognitive, might, I mean, another a synonym might be intellectual or something like that. It's, it's trying to apply what, uh, what this theoretical stuff suggests. I mean, you begin by doing that. The problem is that real life situations are far too complex for you to get very far with it. I mean, that's this, this virtue-based, character-based approach that I'm outlining would, uh, would say that, uh, yes, you do need to have theories like utilitarianism or like egoism or like um, uh, you have to have theories like that, which give you advice about which things you should do. But you need that only at the beginning, I mean, as, as you are building your character. Um, and they may come into, into play at other times, too. I'm not saying that's the only time they come into play, but that's an important time where they are important. But they're not the whole story. Uh, they, are, they are very much like the advice you give to someone who's learning to ride a bicycle. I mean, telling them, well, you got to try and keep your balance, you know, make sure that you can keep pedaling, keep pedaling, or whatever it is that you tell people when they're trying to learn to ride a bicycle. They're getting all of these things right on a test, will not put them in a position to be able to ride a bicycle. Think of it that way. All of this cognitive information that you get, I mean, you could write it all down. All the things that people tell you when you're trying to learn to play tennis, all the things that people tell you when you're trying to learn to ride a bicycle, all the things that people tell you when you're trying to learn to play the piano. I mean, you could write all this stuff down, and you could memorize it. You could do perfectly on a test. You could get hundreds on every, every test that they could give you. You could be a cognitive expert about this information and still not be able to ride a bike, play tennis, or play piano. And that's the point here, too. I mean, even if you master all these intellectual theories about what's or one of them or all of them or find some mix of them, even if you get them all right and you're really, really good at this, that still isn't going to necessarily make you a good person. That still doesn't mean that the decisions you make will necessarily be right. One of the problems that, you, that people are faced with is that real life situations are so complex. There's so many different things that come into play that trying to process all this information cognitively just isn't, about, isn't going to work. I mean, what you really have to do is to find some strategy. It's just like if you were to have to Actually, you know, just think about a championship tennis, tennis game and imagine that what, the, I mean, I guess some people do imagine this. I don't. 
but imagine that the tennis player actually has to process all the physical equations that you'd have to feed into a computer to get it to play like that. Right? That's not the way people work. That's not the way organisms work. They're not sitting there processing complicated equations. Um, it's hard to say what it is that, that people do or organisms do, but it's not that. That's maybe what you, it's, you do something like that at the novice level. You do something like that when you're you know, trying to get, a, get started doing something. You do think a lot about how to put your feet, how to move them, how to hold yourself, what to remember, what to think of, what to look at. You do think of all those things at the very beginning. But the sign of being an expert is not having to worry about all that stuff, just going in and doing it. And that's the, that's the general model that, uh, that I proposed last time. That's the beginning of the general model I proposed last time uh, that had involved uh, building and sustaining and improving one's ethical character. And uh, again, I, I was basing that on a presumption that I didn't really argue for. I just made the claim, the presumption that, that, uh, that people really do have an interest. I mean, they have, it just is a fact that people have an interest in trying to do right. <clears throat> and uh, and even, in the cases, even in cases where it seems plain that people don't have that, it's often because they feel like they've been burned, they feel like they've been, they're justified or something like that. Uh, that by and large, people would rather be uh, do the right thing than do the wrong thing. A fairly controversial presumption, but you know, I ask for your own personal self, uh, appraisal of whether that's true in your case. It's rare for me to find a group of people who think, say, oh, no, no, I don't want to do the right thing. Okay, is that, did that catch that? Okay, good. Okay? All right. Now, for all this stuff about how people are, are, are supposed to try to be ethical or how people might be uh, interested in being a good person and doing the right thing and making the right decisions, <clears throat> uh, it would be perfectly reasonable if uh, somebody argued that this isn't very realistic, especially in the professional setting, that uh, lots of times people don't have quite as much of a real choice about what it is that they're going to do as uh, I might be pretending. What I want to do is to talk toward a certain conclusion. So let me tell you what the conclusion is. And that's to suggest that while sometimes people do have real options, they can choose between uh, things that are more or less right and more or less wrong. I mean, they, they do have at least the option to consider different things and act in, in uh, one way or the other. Um, and so therefore, people aren't completely determined in their behavior by the, the settings that they find themselves in. I will uh, insist that there are sometimes situations that are probably best described as institutional traps. Sometimes uh, people wind up getting into situations where there really isn't much more than one decision that they can make, given the, the constraints that they're under. And I, I guess all I want to do is to say that sometimes the decisions that people make are forced, and that in those cases, it probably wouldn't be proper to find them responsible or to blame for what they do. But that this by no means is all the cases, and so I want to, so that the upshot is, uh, I want to concede a little bit that sometimes people aren't as free uh, to, to make a decision uh, that we might like on the outside. Um, sometimes that is true, but not always. Uh, this, this actually broaches a subject that, uh, that, that could get pretty sticky. Uh, has anyone ever thought about or heard of, for that matter, uh, the, the, the philosophical debate uh, between uh, the ideas of free will and determinism? I mean, is it at least, does it ring a bell in any way or strike some familiar chord? Yes. So, uh, so, that, so that several people have, uh, have either thought about it or heard about it or know, know what I'm talking about. Uh, who, how would it, one of those of you who, who this rings a bell with, how would you contrast the two ideas, free will and determinism? 
just basically you have a couple choices. You can either do what you want to do, or, or the theory is that you can do what you want to do, or your life is determined. Okay, there's two life. different theories about human life, actually. One says that people are able to make choices. They do choose what, uh, you know, course, at least sometimes they do choose uh, uh, between alternatives. The other alternative, which might strike you, the other philosophical position, which might strike you at first as being sort of odd, is that uh, everything that you and I choose really is kind of forced by the situation. It's forced by uh, environmental factors. It's also forced by genetic factors. I mean, the idea here, the deterministic idea, is that uh, uh, we are, each of us, a very complex product of uh, the hardware, if you like, the physical makeup, our physical makeup, our biological construction, the genes, the genetic structure on the one hand, and then uh, our program uh, by way of the life we've lived. Uh, the general term for that is environment. This is all part of the nature-nurture debate that's uh, that, uh, about one thing or another. Are, are people, do people become what they become entirely because of uh, genes or uh, to, to, is there to a large extent or a small extent to which what they become is the product of their environment? Determinism doesn't take any def uh, definite stance on either side of that particular issue. It just would say, though, that what people are is, uh, is a product of those two things in some combination or another. That there isn't a third sort of ghost-like thing, uh, something that transcends biology and environment that can account for sort of free choices. Determinism says we aren't really free. We are the products of biology and the environment. And that when you choose even something frivolous, like let's say you're standing in line at McDonald's and you get up to the front, you still haven't figured out what kind of shake you want or what kind, which, which, uh, which one of the several meals they've got you want to choose. And you just say, oh, well, gee, I don't know. I pick three. There's probably some reason for that, determinism says. Uh, if you flip a coin, and decide, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, you've got, a, let's say you're choosing between two things, a chocolate and a vanilla shake, and you flip a coin, and, you, and, and whatever you choose depends on how the coin lands. Determinism about people, anyway, says, well, you're not, we can't tell you why the coin lands the way it is. We have to turn to physics for that. <clears throat> but we can explain why it is that you flipped a coin. Why you chose that method of deciding between chocolate and vanilla. Determinism suggests that uh, especially the, um, the apparently rational choices we make, not these frivolous ones. I'm saying that determinism can extend right down to these little frivolous things. But uh, uh, certainly, determinism would say that the apparently rational decisions we make are forced. They are kind of made for us by our pasts, if you like, by these various factors that make us what we are. It's not that we don't choose. Of course we choose. We choose all the time. It's the particular choices we make are caused. And so the determinist would say, we're not really free. And uh, all the free will advocate would say is, oh, yes, we are, at least sometimes. That's the only, that's the contrast between the two positions. Now, I don't want to get too deeply into that, but we're going to wind up touching upon it. Uh, first, let me uh, try to illustrate how tricky this ground is. Um, if I were to hold a pistol, a loaded pistol, let's say it wasn't me, let's say it was someone who you really suspected might actually pull the trigger, uh, let's say that person were to stop you on a dark night uh, and hold a gun to your head and say, uh, give me all your money. <coughs> Now the question is, are you free, I mean my first question is, are you free to choose whether to give <coughs> up your money or not? 
you're a college student, you don't have any choice. You don't have any, you don't have any money. <laughs> you just explain that. I don't have any money. I'm a college student. Uh, let's say that you are now embarked upon the lucrative career that you will soon, uh, as soon as you leave RIT, you'll be making millions of dollars. Let's say you're embarked on that career, and so you do have a few cents in your pocket. Um, the, the, my question, though, is uh, are you free to choose? Sure. Sure. Sure, 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 sure. So, I mean, especially since you're sitting in a philosophy class, you're inclined to say, well, yeah, you could choose to say no. Go ahead and blow out my brains. You could choose that. You're kind of dumb, but you could choose that. Um, so you're free. All right, so let's say the person then uh, takes my 35 cents. I am a philosopher after all. Takes my 35 cents and runs off down the street. And, uh, and I go my way, report the incident to the police, and the person is ultimately caught. This is a weird part of this story, but let's say the person is ultimately caught and uh, comes to trial. And, uh, and, and protests his innocence and says, I don't know why I'm here. This is incredible. The person gave me his money of his own free will. He chose to give me his money. He didn't have to give me his money. And, let, and I, let's say I were to claim, no, no, he forced me. I had to give him the money. I, real, I didn't have a choice. Now. That makes sense too, right? I mean, that, when I talk that way, that's not an unusual way to speak. Am I, am I saying something false? I mean, would the, would the, uh, would the judge uh, convict me of perjury if I said that? Find me guilty of, of perjury because, after all, I did have a choice? No. Uh, in the English language, there's a great deal of play, a great deal of flex. Um, and here, what we're inclined to think of as a free choice or as a forced decision um, varies with the context. If you're thinking about it kind of philosophically or abstractly, I guess uh, I had a free choice in, the, in, in, in this little story. But uh, at some other level, or in some, you know, if you're looking at it in a more practical way, I really didn't. Now, what I want to talk about is the possibility, which I think is a very real one, of, uh, one that in fact happens all the time, that a lot of the decisions that people make, that uh, maybe even a lot of the ones that we're inclined to blame them for, are ones that first of all appear to them from the inside, very much like this business about having a gun held to their head. And I'm thinking about the situations that we before have talked about in terms of whistleblowing. I think in one of the very earliest of our class sessions, we talked briefly about that. Situations where a person finds oneself on the job with all, all of these different obligations to all kinds of different people, moved and motivated by all these different sources of standards of conduct concerned about keeping their job, concerned about doing a good job, concerned about being loyal to their employer, concerned about society, concerned about all these different things. I mean, imagine such a person who, in a professional, I'm not going to specify any particular profession, but uh, somebody who is uh, either working for a client or is perhaps employed by somebody or perhaps has a supervisor who they find to be doing something that's either unsafe or otherwise unethical. And let's say, uh, and let's say they, um, they think about it for a while and decided to report what they found to the client or to their employer, go through the channels, whatever they might be, and to say, look, I, we've, I found something that's a little questionable here. We'd we better clear this up. And let's say the word they get back from client or boss, supervisor, whatever, is, uh, yeah, that's a real problem. We better shut up. Shut up about that. We're going to get into a lot of trouble if word gets out. And I want you to think about that situation. Uh, it's, so far, I haven't specified much detail. But uh, it wouldn't be hard to imagine that there's all kinds of different uh, 
uh, external factors that could be attached to this story that uh, would make a difference in what you expect you would do or what any normal person would do. I'm mostly interested in examining not these questions about what people would do, realistically speaking. I'm interested in seeing what happens to our understanding of what people should do. So that let's say, for example, it, uh, it first of all appears to the person that the cost, the cost of trying to uh, um, um, improve the situation, whether it's uh, making an unsafe process safe, yes. or whether it's correcting something that's uh, some unethical procedure that's, uh, that's going on uh, in the area where they're working. Let's say it's, it begins to seem to them that the cost of clearing this up might be their job. Uh, first of all, I, I ask you to consider the possibility that this might very well, <coughs> when they're trying to decide what they should do, uh, you, we can increase the stakes in this story so that it, it, it gets closer and closer and closer to looking like, some, at least to them, that uh, a gun is being held to their head. For example, if the person's job is, uh, is a rare one, if there aren't many jobs around, if they are trained in a very, uh, a very specialized profession, uh, and, uh, and let's say they're o uh, older, an older worker, they're not younger, I mean as hard as it is for young people to find jobs these days, I hope things have improved, but as hard as it has been for young people to find jobs, it's been harder yet for older people to find jobs if they get laid off. Let's say the stakes are dire. Let's say it's hospital bills for somebody who, uh, somebody in the family who's a dependent of the worker, or the kids have to eat. I mean, make the make the consequences as dire as you please. As you increase the stakes like this, it can look to the person inside the situation more and more like the, the little situation of a gun being held to their head. You see what I'm saying? And as that, as that happens, I mean, what does that do to the idea that, uh, that we might have had that the person is free? I mean, you might say that, well, you could always quit, quit your job. I mean, there's a lot of different things people could do. They, continue, they could continue the effort to solve the problem internally, uh, or they could just quietly go back to their job and stop thinking about it. They could, uh, I mean, this is all, I mean, plainly they could just enlist in and say, oh boy, you know, bad behavior, that's great. They could, they could do that, I and mean, that's at least logically possible. They could, uh, um, they could whistleblow, they could report the matter to outside authorities, they could quit their job. I mean, there's all kinds of different options that they technically have, but let's try to narrow them down. Let's imagine that uh, trying several of the less dire ones, it begins to look more and more as if it's going to be either shut up or, or quit, or get fired. Um, now, first of all, my guess is that that's the way situations often appear to people from the inside. I mean, but, but we're talking about appearances here. Uh, as as was discussed before when we were talking about relativism and what people believe, that doesn't necessarily uh, reflect um, the way things really are. So people might think that all these dire consequences would occur uh, if they blew the whistle, or they may think that they'd better not talk to the boss one more time or else they're going to get in trouble. They may be wrong in this, in this appraisal. But, um, but what about ethical decision making in that kind of context? I mean, what should people do? Now, again, not what do you think people would do. What are the ethical considerations that enter into such situations? What do you think other people should do? What do you think you should do? Yeah. I think he still has a choice. Whether or not to uh, whistleblow or not, but uh, 
it might, it might not be the right one. Or... Right, <laughs> but you're saying that no, no matter how people. no matter how harsh I make the consequences, he still has a choice. Still has a choice. So, but that's just like saying even though a gun is being held to my head, I still have a choice, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, and I don't deny that, but isn't it nevertheless a forced decision? I mean, if I were then to claim this person is responsible. Well, then, then you're saying that everything else is a forced decision that we make. I don't know about everything else. I'm just talking about these high stakes, high cost decisions. There is some sense in which they're not, they're not technically, I mean, I think what I want to concede is they're not, I mean, I haven't given you any reason to think that they are technically caused by something other than me. In fact, I don't even believe that. Uh, and indeed, I want to concede further that yes, a person can, could choose uh, to do what uh, might be the more difficult thing. I mean, it's possible for them to do. Um, but on the other hand, I want to, I want to say that it's, it, it, you, can make, you, you can make these situations dire enough so that they come very, very close to situations in which you know, I'm, a gun is actually at my head. And where the gun was at my head, uh, I don't think anybody would think that I, you know, I then have to uh, go along with the fact that my money has, has been given to this other person. It's not like a gift. It's not really voluntary. I mean, we wouldn't say that that's a voluntary relinquishing of my money. And I think, and, and so therefore, I'm not responsible for its consequences. Uh, similarly here, it's, I, I, all I want to do is to establish first two things. One's very, very modest. I want to establish the possibility that things might appear that way to somebody, or even that things may appear that way to lots of people. It may appear to people that if they don't toe the line, the costs are going to be incredibly dire. It would be awful. And that they just have to go along. In fact, I think that's the way things do appear to lots of people, if not most people. That they have to go along with the way things are done, or else the costs would be horrible. I'm sure, you know, so that, that, that's the, the modest thing I want to establish is that they would appear, that they could appear that, that way to somebody. The uh, slightly less modest thing I want to establish is that people are sometimes right. The costs would be that dire. That in all kinds of walks of life, even in, uh, uh, I mean, certainly this is true throughout the world, but even in the most developed countries in the world, it continue, it, it's still the case that uh, sometimes people are not really, realistically, able to make certain decisions. But you know, not, not it, technically they're able. They could say, no, I'm not going <coughs> to give my money. And sometimes people do that. And they get their head, their brains blown out. Um, but that doesn't change the fact that uh, if they give up their money, they're forced. It's not voluntary. Again, that's, that's just a thesis. I want to know what your thoughts are about that. What, what its upshot is that at least sometimes when people make decisions that we might think of as wrong, as having bad consequences or wrong for some other reason, sometimes it really wouldn't be appropriate to blame them. They're doing it because the, 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 the pressures on them are, are sufficiently great as to make it realistically impossible for them to choose anything else. It's just a, a proposition I put before you. That if we ask people to behave differently, it's like asking people to allow their heads to be blown off. That's the way it seems to them, and that sometimes that's actually the way it is. Now, how about I mean, your appraisal, your judgment about the way it is? I mean, I'm, just, I'm just laying out a particular <clears throat> portrait of how things go. I'm, 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 I'm urging you to consider the possibility that sometimes decisions, while they're made by people, they're forced decisions. Decisions sometimes that might lead to bad consequences. A good test for such situations, while you're thinking about that, might be this. Uh, if you could 
I mean, maybe I'll call it the Mahatma Gandhi test or something like that. If Mahatma Gandhi, I mean, if, if the most ethical person you can think of were in that same situation, would they find it necessary to do the same thing? If so, then it's hard to blame the person for doing it. <coughs> Sometimes it might be that what's constraining isn't some threat. It might be that the consequences of, you know, that you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. The consequences of deciding either way are awful. And so what you try to do is to choose the best of the two options. So what do you think? I mean, are, are decisions ever forced in that way in real life social settings? Yes? You may think that they are at the time. I mean, some guy has a gun to your head. And I'd, I'd rather, you know, give him a couple of bucks and get him away from me than have my brain, you know, my brain shot out. But I don't think it's forced. It, 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 it does come out to be choice. Because of that, you're making a decision. Well, do you want to keep the money? Or do you want to keep your life? Okay, I guess what this comes down to is, uh, is uh, a suggestion that while, yes, it's choice, the choice you make isn't really free. Um, you know, a comparable free choice would be one in which I guess you, uh, you had the choice of having your brains blown out or giving somebody your money. And you really were able to say, I just don't want either. <laughs> I don't want to do either of those things. Uh, what what, what <coughs> being embedded in that holdup situation does is to reduce your options to, well, apparently, anyway. And again, you've emphasized, again, someone might believe this. It, it apparently reduces your option to just these two unpleasant ones. And it's pretty plain, which is the, is the, is the least bad. And I'm, I guess, uh, a nice way of, of summarizing what I've suggested about professional settings or even just sort of normal, everyday life settings is that sometimes the setup that you find yourself in constrains things similar. Yeah. You know, I was thinking in a, in a professional setting, um, it's never going to be a, a really a gun to your head, but I, I think that the problems that do come up, you will compromise your own values and moral, uh, your own moral being. Because they're really not death threat situations, but they're things that you say, well, you know, and in the end, you know, all these compromises come up to be something big. And I think, you know, that's one of the bigger problems in a professional setting. It's, it's you against them kind of thing. Okay. Uh, sometimes, though, this, this, you'll be one of them. I mean, sometimes these, these, this, these pressures and these conflicts will come up if you're in an administrative setting. But let me, I guess, you talked about compromising your being or compromising, I guess, your standards. Uh, and you said uh, often enough, it may be that you, one would do this. One would perhaps need to do this, or it's natural to do this. Again, what I'm interested in is, what should one do? Uh, when faced with the, this particular kind of option. I mean, um, should one, ethically speaking, ignore those many factors that might make that, that might make you think you should go along, should you ignore them? Uh, you know, imagine that, for example, the person who is at risk of losing a job over this issue really has a responsibility for other people that are dependent upon this job. I mean, the, the, the tricky question here. The, the one I'm asking you to consider is uh, whether one does something wrong in choosing to just go along in situations that are forced in this way. I mean, I, th I think in some respects, in, in today's professional setting, I think you're expected to go along. And to the degree, I'm not talking to the degree of death, I'm not talking, I think in smaller situations, you're expected to go along, it's your job to go along. 
in some decisions that you morally feel are wrong. Mm -hmm. I think that's, you, you are hired to do that. Does that generate? I mean, that's a part of the job in some in some instances. I'm not saying in every instance. But does all. that generate any moral obligation on your part? Uh, that's that's something that's that's going to be uh, your moral decision to find out. <laughs> so you think that this is completely subjective? Absolutely. I, you don't I, think there's a truth of the matter about whether one acquires moral obligations having signed an employment contract. I think that there's definitely a great a gray area there that uh, you walk into and you can either walk out being 100% sure of yourself that you're right or you can stay in the gray area and keep your job. Okay, but you're talking about uh, being sure of yourself and confident. These are psychological categories I'm, and I keep asking you a different sort of question about whether you really are right um, and you keep returning to a perspectival uh, stance that talks about what people think or believe, and I guess that's that's a, it, it's. They uh, may know they're wrong. Pardon? But uh, they may know they're wrong, but they'll still go along with it. I honestly believe that. In some cases, I'm not talking about everyone, well, I have no doubt about that. I mean, I, I'm not arguing about what people would do. The question, though, is, have we heard from you what you think people should do? No, because from instance to instance, I think it's going to be very different. Okay, it's definitely so a situational-based uh, question. All right. Well, but I, um, uh, as far as the gun situation, we've answered that. No, we're going to give up the money mm -hmm. for the gun. I don't, I don't think you can get away from the gun situation. Yeah. yeah so, the, so the, in that particular situation, it's not would though. I'm, I'm asking a should question. That uh, are you saying that by and large, in your view, people should you know, give up the money? I think they should, I mean, yeah. if they care about their lunch. But that's the nature of the question I'm asking here as well. It's not just what would I do, what would people do. It's not a question about polls. It's not a question about behavioral analysis. It's a question about ethics. And what I'm trying to get you to consider is at least this possibility. That sometimes people do not do wrong Sometimes people do not do wrong when they do things that have bad consequences. There's all kinds of reasons why this might be the case. One reason why it might be the case uh, is that um, what's up? Something? I'll just try my pen. Okay. <laughs> One reason why this might be the case is because the consequences of uh, of uh, of doing anything. I mean, you're, 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 you're not free to, to, uh, to not have consequences. Even inaction is something that has consequences. And so no matter what choice you make, there will be bad consequences. And so you have to make a judgment from among them. I mean, that's a possibility. That's, a matter of fact, I think something that is usually the case. When we're trying to decide what to do, we're not faced with pure good and pure evil, by and large. We're faced with complicated situations that affect different people's interests, different people's rights, differently. And it's difficult sometimes to sort through these things, yes? I think it depends on whether somebody can live with that decision. I keep thinking of examples of, you know, having to make choices. And if you know you can think through the two choices, and you know that, like you said before, you're damned if you do and damned if you don't, but you know that you have, like, for example, financial obligations, and you know that you have to, to be able to support your family, and you can live with that decision, whatever that is, then I think that's what you should do. Mm -hmm. But I don't think I'm in a position to judge whether you can live with those, that decision or not. I think that's up to the individual. Well, let me, again, I'm not going to direct this just to you, but we're back on, on a... On a a very, I mean, this is uh, certainly understandable. I'm sympathetic with it to a great extent, but I'm puzzled about this subjectivist orientation. And so let me put it to you this way. When you, su when you suggest, or when the suggestion is made that it depends upon a person's ability to live with a decision, then everything depends on how hard-skinned they are. And so the way for me to avoid moral dilemmas, it would seem, is to try to develop the toughest skin so that I can live with anything. And if that's all that there was to making moral decisions, then that would be a perfectly moral thing to do. So I should toughen my skin. No, because I don't 
think that everybody has the same reaction to things, and that their values are different, and they can, it doesn't necessarily, it's not a matter of thin skin or tough skin. Well, let's say I find that there's certain decisions I just can't live with. There's two alternatives I've got. One, don't do them. Two, learn to live with them. And that's, uh, that either one resolves the dilemma. Now, it strikes me that uh, behind the idea that we shouldn't do those things that we can't live with is something else. It's not just a subjectivist, not just a question of feeling and what you can live with. There's this presumption that if you can't live with the thing, if your conscience is bothering you, there's something possibly wrong with it. And that wrong thing is a whole different level of analysis. And that's the one I want us to be at. I want to talk about which things are not unlikely that people would do them, but which things are wrong. And, I, and, and again, I'm, I'm offering you, and indeed encouraging you, to think that sometimes when people do stuff that we're inclined to label as wrong, we may be mislabeling it. Reason being, they're under the gun. And that diminishes, anyway, culpability to a certain extent. <coughs> and the key to when that, that might be the case, I suggested, uh, has to do with this, uh, uh, this, this, this test that I suggest that you apply. If anybody, if, the, if, if anybody who was trying to do the best they could, if they found themselves in that situation and did the same thing, then maybe we shouldn't blame the person. Maybe it's the situation. And in professional settings, I think it happens a lot that bad decisions arise, decisions that have bad consequences to society, decisions that in fact from some perspective, some perspective or another are wrong, ethically wrong, are nevertheless not the, it's, it, they cannot be placed at the door of any particular actor, any particular person. That sometimes it's because it's the whole institutional setting that yields this result. And even if you said, even if you assigned guilt, and you said, I found the person who made this decision, and you fired him, and then replaced them, the next person, because they're in that same situation with the same pressures on them, is very likely to make the same kind of decision. There may be no other decision possible. Now, without getting into specific examples, uh, let me just say that I, I think that that happens fairly frequently, that sometimes it's the, uh, the, the setup of a particular firm or company, or sometimes it's the way business is done in a, in a particular area. Uh, it's institutional, things like that, that yields crummy consequences, violations of rights, and not necessarily a bad will person or even a, an ethically inept person. I mean, sometimes there are ins institutional settings which just have certain kinds of, 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 of built-in pressure uh, that almost produces certain decisions regularly. Where that's the case, I mean, I don't say we throw up our hands, but where that's the case, if we ever discover that, wow, it's not the person that's to blame, it's the way that this, this, this business works, it's the way this institution works, in those cases, I would think then, if we have any moral obligations ourselves as analysts, as critics, as observers, it would be to try and change that institutional setup to relieve the pressures. Yeah? I believe that when you hire someone or when you designate duties to someone. A little louder, please, so we can hear it from. When you hire someone or when you designate duties to someone, you pretty much install your, instill your trust in them and trust that they're going to make the same decisions uh, almost that you would make in certain situations and under pressure. And if they by chance make a wrong decision, I don't think that it's the responsibility of the person to necessarily take um, the consequences for it, but rather the institution and, and what they're going to do to, to rectify the institution or the situation. Not so much the fact that they committed the deed or the wrong uh, decision, but what they did to 
either correct themselves or correct what the their response was. What the exactly. response was. And if, if, if non responsive, then we have some sign that there's moral culpability someplace. But if responsive, that's, that's different. Right. I think I don't disagree with you. All I want to do is to make clear that I'm not saying either that all decisions that are made are forced. And I'm obviously not saying that no decisions are forced. What I want to suggest is these situations do come up <coughs> and I want to attach a name to them. I think sometimes people find themselves in institutional traps. That's the name, institutional traps. I'll write it down on this thing. And what those are are situations in which decision making is constrained in the same kind of way it's constrained when we get the, the gun to the head. I mean, it's not that a per it's impossible for a person to choose in more than one way. I mean, it's not technically impossible. Nevertheless, the decisions are forced. And, and usually because the consequences of any other decision are so terrible that this is the best of the, of the lot. Now, when you get a situation like that, uh, it's hard to hold the individual responsible any more than you would hold it. You know, like if someone held a gun to your head, and in law we don't do this, but somebody held a gun to your head and said, I want you, or if they held a gun to your kid and said, I want you to go in there and uh, knock over that 7-Eleven. Now, because somebody's holding a gun to your kid's head, you might go in and do it. I think if you could prove that that was the situation in the court of law, you certainly would not be found guilty of breaking, entering, robbery, or any of that, st any of that stuff. Yeah, that's the sort of thing I'm suggesting to you. That sometimes, uh, where, where certainly where people genuinely are constrained in this way, so that there really is only one decision that's possible given the horrible consequences of any other, certainly where that really is the case, the people who make that decision shouldn't be held morally responsible for it. We shouldn't blame them. They're only doing what anybody would do in that situation. And they're probably, if it's, if it's because of some, you know, it's because of other ethical obligations, they may very well be doing, and this is the thing I want to get, they may be doing what they should do. They're trying to choose the best course from a number of courses. They're trying hard to do what's right. They don't see themselves as merely um, falling prey to temptation, as doing something venial, something bad. They may very well see themselves as having picking out from a number of impossibly awful alternatives the very best decision that they can make. Now, where that really is the case, <coughs> I'd hold anyway, we'd be wrong to blame them. And where it appears to them, where we could establish that that's the way things look to them, even if they're wrong about it, that's the way that things look to them, we can at least understand why they act the way they do. It's because things look that way to them. Because things that, that, that any other decision than the one that they made seems to them, given their consideration of the matter, seems to them to be so bad as to make this the only real viable option. Perhaps the only ethically viable option. Yep. Oh, I was just looking at the standpoints of the fact that everyone's not going to be a victim kind of thing. It's. Uh, a no hope kind of situation. Well, I, I tend to think yes, there are many uh, many people that are to the gun. Um, many people who who you know have who are under a gun are, kind of situation. Yes, right. uh, you know, I tend to think that yeah, you know, going back to this thing we talked about Tuesday, there is good. Uh, people can come out of these situations on the lighter side of things, and you know. I don't think there's such a, a dark, cavernous kind of area that all these people sit. OK, I don't wish to, I don't want to describe it as being the general rule by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, and uh, so that's, that's one caveat. It may be that, the, that these situations that I'm describing are relatively rare, in which case 
Uh, they do not characterize the general situation of mankind as uh, hum humanity goes about its business. And it certainly doesn't necessarily uh, accurately portray uh, you know, professional life if indeed these settings, these institutional traps are, are relatively uncommon or even if they're not dominant. Uh, that's one thing. And secondly, uh, I'm not going to leave the matter there. As I say, it's, it's not that we throw up our hands, and I want to talk uh, in the next uh, class, the next time we speak, I want to talk about uh, other kinds of ethical responsibilities that relate uh, to the existence of institutional traps. For, for now, though, all I want to do is to establish their existence. Uh, first, modestly, uh, I want to establish that that's certainly that that's the way things that look to people, even though they might be wrong that the consequences are that dire, that there really is only one uh, decision that they can make. Um, but then less modestly, I want to, I want to argue that uh, in fact they're right. Sometimes people are right, not all the time, but sometimes people are right. Sometimes it is not the person who's to blame, it's, the, it's, it's something about the institutional setup. Anybody in that position uh, would do the same thing. Now look, another aspect of this, and in fact, in fact the one that uh, I guess first attracted me to this, this whole area uh, isn't, isn't kind of the, the dilemma of the person on the inside. <clears throat> I have sometimes become concerned that, it's, that, that people too easily decide that that problems have been solved when a particular person has been removed from the scene, fired, for example. That sometimes uh, when, when we have problems uh, that, uh, that uh, have bad effects and we are looking for culprits, um, we give up our efforts as soon as we find somebody who it's likely we could blame, someone who is I mean, perhaps was you know, holding the throttle at the time a particular decision was made. And uh, then we take, remove that, we, you know, we see to it that that person gets fired or otherwise penalized. We plop somebody else down in that very same position without looking at the institutional setup around them. Now, if it's the case, if it's the case that anybody would have acted the same way in that particular uh, situation, if Mahatma, this is the Mahatma Gandhi test, if Mahatma Gandhi would have acted in that same way in that situation, then we haven't solved anything by replacing the person. Because now we've just got another placeholder who's going to wind up, by hypothesis, doing the same thing when the situation arises again. If we really want to solve the problem, uh, it's important not to, to stop at getting rid of a, an allegedly culpable person. Sometimes it's not the person that's to blame. It's the setting. Now, sometimes people talk about this as, uh, this, uh, as, uh, as, a, as a question of corporate responsibility to be distinguished from individual responsibility. It's OK to talk about it like that. It's just that I don't know that I really think that you know, that I, it, it's, a, it's a dumb little point, but I don't really like talking about things like corporations or institutions as being uh, culpable. They're not thinkers. They're not. They're not minds. They're they're just uh, social artifacts. Nevertheless, if what you want to do is to figure out how to solve the problem, it may be the corporate setup. It may be the institutional setup that needs attention. That may be the problem. And we uh, uh, hurt ourselves if if we constantly imagine that uh, that every problem must be uh, the result of individual wrongdoing, blameworthiness, and don't ever focus attention on those institutional settings, which might actually constrain the problem in such a way so as to uh, make it impossible to do anything but what's done. So I mean, that's, that's how I come to this issue, you know, concerned for trying to to, to fix problems. I mean, where, where we have uh, problems in uh, uh, pr 
problems of ind you know, individual behavior uh, within various corporate or other institutional settings where we have uh, uh, you know, safety issues. Uh, it, it may very well be the case that, that some of the things just won't be resolved, some of the problems just won't be resolved until we sort of uh, revise or address or, or, or examine the institutional arrangements within which decisions get made. So I mean that's, that's how I come to this. Um, and then in the present discussion, I'm, I'm emphasizing the other side of that, namely that from, from within, a person might, the person who makes a decision that um, yields bad consequences. A person who, on a superficial reading, we might describe as doing something wrong, it's at least in principle possible they are struggling to do what's right. But the situation leads them to the decision that they make. And those are what I call the institutional traps, situations in which decisions are nearly as forced as is the decision to give up your money when a gun's being held to your head. I mean, it's not that a person couldn't technically decide differently. It's that the costs of deciding differently are so enormously huge that it's not really a viable alternative. It's not even a viable ethical alternative. I mean, should one? I mean, let's. I mean, I, you can imagine. I mean, I guess the the, the story about a person being uh, forced to rob a Seven Eleven <coughs> is a, is a situation in which a person is forced to do something wrong in order to avoid a, a greater wrong. At least I would suppose that that's the way it would seem to the person involved. Um, should we blame the person for violating the laws against theft? I mean, situations get sticky if then the theft leads to yet another death. I mean, I, it, it, everything can be made as sticky as you please, but I'm just I'm trying to keep things clear that when, that sometimes uh, a person may make a decision that actually is wrong from one perspective, they might do it because in a larger perspective, um, it's the right thing to do. Let me, um, have I distinguished uh, among prima facie, I think the word comes up on the reading, so, and, and so let me ask you explicitly whether in class I've distinguished between prima facie right and all things considered right. Is that something we went through? I think maybe not. Uh, it may have been in the other section. But let me do that. Um, perhaps come back to institutional traps. Um, Prima facie right or prima facie wrong as opposed to right or wrong as considered. What's a prima facie mean? Anybody? Just out of curiosity? Is it on the surface? Yeah. Yeah, the, the, uh, a kind of literal translation might be first face or at first glance, but on the surface or also at first glance, those are real good translations of prima facie that will help you remember what, uh, what they are. Uh, a, it might be right prima facie at first glance to tell the truth and wrong to lie. But that doesn't mean that all things considered in every case, you should tell the truth or that you shouldn't lie. There are some cases in which possibly some other obligation, like protecting the innocent, might dictate a lie in a particular case. For example, uh, 
standard in ethics textbooks. If you are in Germany in the 1930s and the stormtroopers come around and ask you, where did that Jewish family go that lived next door to you? Uh, and if you know, but say, I don't know, that's probably the best thing you can do in the circumstances. That's right, all, you know, like all things considered, even though it's a lie. Because it's more important to protect those lives than to obey this thing about telling the truth. Something can be right or wrong on the surface, prima facie, at first glance. There's, there's millions of them. I mean, you can list these things. Uh, things that, you know, various degrees of generality that are right or wrong, if you just think about them in isolation. But in real situations, you're, you're going to get all kinds of them coming together. And it'll be a, a difficult issue to decide which one takes precedence in a particular case. Sure, you should tell the truth, but if somebody asks you uh, how you like their sweater or something like that, you know, it's not necessary to be, you know, if, if, let's say you don't like their shirt, it's not necessarily necessary to be brutally honest. Because, uh, and this is an ethical matter, you're, uh, you're supposed to not only be honest, but you're also supposed to be kind. And in this particular case, honesty and kindness come into conflict, so you have to choose. Well, that's what I'm suggesting goes on in real life all the time. That one isn't faced with uh, situations where one can just simply follow some list. List of right things and wrong things. The list, the list of prima facie right things and wrong things if you, if you, is going to conflict in almost every real life situation. You're going to have to make judgments about which one takes precedence in this case. Should I help society or should I support my kids? I got obligations in both directions. How long should I continue to be loyal to my employer? I mean, I do owe my employer something, perhaps. I mean, there's contractual, I mean, I should probably follow procedures within the company to the extent that there are procedures for reporting safety problems. <coughs> but, you know, when should I give up on those procedures? I mean, I, should, I'm, I shouldn't just go running out and reporting to you know, the New York Times every time I think something's wrong. I should at least look into the matter a little bit. I've got at least those obligations to, to the company that I work for, to clients. Or to, I mean, I've got some obligations to them at least. Well, how do, you, how, do you, how do you balance all of these things? That's a question of judgment. It's not altogether clear at all. They may very well come into conflict. And sometimes people who we regard as doing something wrong are just doing the very best they can in that situation. If we learn more details about the various factors in the case, sometimes we would become less sure that the person had done wrong. Now those are the, they're certainly not, that's not the way all situations are, but where that's the situation, that's what I call an institutional trap. And as we'll see next time, this isn't the place to throw up one's hands and say, ah, there's nothing that's to be done. Instead, there are responsibilities on the part of lots of people. Certainly, whoever sees that these traps exist, there are responsibilities to try and remove them. Or well, there may be such responsibilities. Anyway. Any questions, comments? OK. See you next time.